Good evening and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight we look at last week's meeting in Madrid between the Spanish Foreign Minister, José Manuel García Margallo, and the UK Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond. It was a bilateral meeting between the UK and Spanish governments, and Gibraltar was discussed. But was it a bilateral on Gibraltar? Well, I'm very pleased with the way that uh, the Foreign Secretary's meeting with the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Spain went in the sense that it was exactly what had been agreed with the government of Gibraltar in relation to Gibraltar, and you wouldn't expect otherwise. Well, I take Philip Hammond's statements at face value. He says it was a bilateral on European and world affairs, but not a bilateral on Gibraltar. I have no reason to doubt that. Also in tonight's viewpoint, we look at Mr. Margallo's announcement that he's going to close the Instituto Cervantes in Gibraltar. Hombre, lógicamente estamos todos muy apenados, ¿no? No te puedo decir que el anuncio del cierre nos haya alegrado. Lógicamente hemos dedicado muchísimas horas de trabajo a la comunidad. Creo que hemos dado un servicio al menos digno a la comunidad de Gibraltar. I don't know what the opponents of the Instituto Cervantes in Gibraltar ever thought or feared that it might be. It's not capable of being a Trojan horse. We start tonight at a press conference in Madrid, where the Spanish Foreign Ministry initially denied access to GBC and the Gibraltar Chronicle. We were told the decision had been taken at a high level. The Chronicle tweeted about it and GBC highlighted its position in the Spanish media. After this, and with just minutes to go to the start of the conference, our cameraman Alan Guerrero and reporter Cristina Cortez were allowed in. On the agenda, discussions about terrorism in Europe, a matter concerning the security of many hundreds of millions of people. Russia's war on Ukraine, where the death toll continues to rise, and what might be done to avoid an economic catastrophe in Greece. Yet despite this treacherous foreign policy terrain, the two politicians seem to spend a surprising amount of time talking about Gibraltar. Mr. Garcia Margallo devoted a total of seven and a half minutes to the rock, almost as much time on this one issue as he spent on the threat of terrorism, war and economics combined. I think in Gibraltar, the last uh, three and, uh, years and, and two months, almost three and a half years, have taught us not to be surprised by anything that Mr. Madagayo might do or try to do in relation to Gibraltar, and not to be surprised by his obvious obsession with Gibraltar. And I think what characterizes his period as Minister for Foreign Affairs is not just a throwback to the way that matters are being handled to, to the sort of 60s and 70s style of things, but also the constant repetition of things which are defamatory and untrue about Gibraltar and the constant concentration on the subject when there are obviously more important things in foreign relations. Forget the, the importance of all the issues afflicting Spain. There are obviously more important things in foreign affairs concerning the 28 members of the European Union and uh, the United States and, uh, and the NATO alliance than Spain's obsession. Let's not put it that way. Let's put it as Mr. Madrigal's obsession with Gibraltar. On Gibraltar, ad hoc talks was the main talking point. The Spanish foreign minister claimed progress had been achieved in Madrid. The UK foreign secretary didn't go quite as far. He said he was hopeful progress could be made. Well, whether there is going to be progress on the ad hoc talks really depends, in my view, on what are these new proposals that are being put forward by the Spanish government and, uh, and also whether those are going to be acceptable to the Gibraltar government too. I've not had an opportunity to sit down with the Chief Minister in order to discuss that, so I prefer to reserve my judgment in relation to it until after that. I have to say that I have my doubts uh, despite the fact that, you know, I am a proponent of dialogue. My party has been a proponent of dialogue. The cornerstone of our policy in relation to Spain has been safe dialogue going back to 1991, and indeed we're the architects of the tripartite talks. But I have serious doubts as to whether anything is going to be, uh, any, any useful uh, purpose is going to be served with the ad hoc talks at this stage in the political cycle, so close to a general election in Spain, so close to a general election in the United Kingdom, so close to a general election in Gibraltar. The only purpose that I can see is that, well, there is going to be contact. And, you know, from those very, very small uh, starts, that, that contact, you may be able to build bridges. Although I have to say, even that is difficult in the light of some of the statements made by Mr. Margallo and some of the decisions taken by the, by the Spanish government. They, are being, they have been belligerent in the extreme, which makes it even difficult for somebody like me, who has been a major proponent of dialogue. 
a lot of dissembling from the Spanish side, a lot of trying to persuade people that something might go on or was going on that was entirely different. And we have seen this from the beginning of Mr. Malayo arriving at the Palacio de Santa Cruz, the attempt to go back to bilateralism, the failure to be able to engage the Brussels process in any way, and therefore the surreptitious uh, attempt to pretend that any encounter which involves him and a British counterpart is a bilateral on Gibraltar in order to try and sell that in Spain as the achievement of his attempt to return to bilateralism, which of course is never going to happen. And, and what happened was that Mr. Hammond put to his Spanish counterpart the issues of concern that had been discussed with the government of Gibraltar, and he expressly said, and, and you will have picked this up from the language, it's new language, in the way that the United Kingdom expressed itself in Madrid and in relation to uh, the Spanish foreign ministry, that he put the concerns of the government of the United Kingdom and of Her Majesty's government of Gibraltar to his Spanish counterpart. That is new language. Uh, before we've always heard the United Kingdom say, you know, we raised our concerns about Gibraltar, the British hour there being collective. Here there was explicitly the position of Her Majesty's government and the position of Her Majesty's government of Gibraltar being put as concerns, not agenda items, simply issues to be discussed around what the bilateral meeting was about. Again, there were differing takes on aviation and Gibraltar's right to be included in new EU single skies legislation. Absolutely. The position put by Mr. Hammond in relation to aviation and uh, the application of EU air liberalisation packages to Gibraltar is exactly the position of the government of Gibraltar. The United Kingdom and the government of Gibraltar are entirely of one mind as to how to deal with the subject and what is and is not acceptable. Our red lines as to process and as to finality are identical and he expressed that in the way that we had agreed it would be. And I would hope that Philip Hammond backs up those statements with legal action if necessary because if the Spanish government is hell-bent on uh, undoing the Cordova Agreement and excluding Gibraltar from single skies, if they're hell-bent on that, I would hope the United Kingdom takes all necessary legal action in Europe to prevent that. That is the only way that the United Kingdom effectively discharges its duty to Gibraltar. Mr Hammond said he'd raised the UK and Gibraltar's concerns about incursions into British Gibraltar territorial waters. But Mr Garcia Margallo didn't respond to this in the press conference. He did, however, respond to the Foreign Secretary's comments about continuing delays at the frontier. And, of course, although uh, our meeting today is not about Gibraltar, of course we have uh, discussed uh, the issue of Gibraltar, and I have raised my concerns and the Government of Gibraltar's concerns about the continued delays uh, at the Gibraltar-Spanish border, about the incursions in British Gibraltar territorial waters, uh, and about uh, the delays to European Union aviation legislation uh, that have been caused by Spanish objections uh, to the inclusion uh, of Gibraltar Airport. Estamos cumpliendo nuestra obligación de vigilar que en un, en una, en un borde que eh, separa la zona de Schengen y que separa una parte Gibraltar que no está incluido en la Unión Aduanera de otro, no se produzcan tráficos ilícitos y en especial tráficos de contrabando. Los datos que he ofrecido al ministro es que los controles han demostrado ser efectivos, se ha reducido el tráfico por la verja, pero se ha desviado desde el punto de vista marítimo. In front of uh, a room full of Spanish press when Mr. Margallo said this, uh, Mr. Hammond didn't didn't respond. I mean, what do you make of that? Well, I, I tell you that I would like to uh, ask you to paraphrase in your mind for one moment the the name of a particular film of some years ago and see what Mr. Margallo said as really fags, lies and videotape. So they want to talk about tobacco. They produce some video evidence, which is you know, very uh, scandalous. They put it on their morning programs, and they use that to try and defame Gibraltar as, as much as possible without looking at the reality of what's going on here. Gibraltar has acted in the past uh, three years and two months that I've been chief minister. We've raised the price of tobacco quite exponentially, 63%. We've toughened our laws. We've done everything that we needed to do, even before the European Commission and OLAF became involved. We continue 
continued on that road in cooperation with OLAF and the European Commission to ensure that the legitimate business in tobacco that Gibraltar has, as every other member state of the European Union has, is not tainted by the illegitimate business in tobacco, which some Spanish organized criminal groups are trying to um, exploit. Now, uh, that really comes from the economic crisis in Spain and from the fact that Spain itself has acted in a way that is, in my view, totally responsible, which is to lessen the penalties which apply to the smuggling of tobacco and therefore in that way encourage that people who are desperate might go down that route, given that the penalties they face if they're caught are actually less. Well, I think that's what Mr. Philip Hammond should have said to Mr. Margajo uh, was, well, go to Andorra and uh, basically look at the tobacco that's being smuggled from Andorra into Spain, which is far, far higher volumes than any uh, tobacco smuggling that occurs between Gibraltar and Spain. And that tells you that it's all politically motivated. It's nothing to do with tobacco smuggling. It's politically motivated. The reality of the situation is that if Mr. Margarita thinks that the measures that have been taken at the frontier are effective, well, actually, they've been effective in order to damage and in order to hurt his own people, because he's got 10,000 workers whose only sin in life has been that they want to earn a living for their families and cross every single day. And those are the people that Mr. Margaja is actually hurting. Mr. Margaja is also hurting all those businesses in the Campo de Gibraltar who are down, some of them, by 40, 50 percent in business because Gibraltarians don't want to cross the frontier because of those measures that Mr. Margallo has taken at the frontier. So effective? Well, look, in what world does Mr. Margallo actually live to say that the measures have been effective? They've been effective in hurting Gibraltar, Spanish relations, and in damaging the interests of his own people. That's how effective they've been. Is it true that the tobacco business has been displaced to uh, the water rather than the frontier? Well, look, as those of us who live in Gibraltar know, the illegitimate tobacco business goes across the frontier and it goes uh, on Western Beach and Eastern Beach. The police and, and customs do an excellent job of trying to control it. We cannot have a permanent 24-hour presence there. But every day there are arrests in Gibraltar for people of people trying to smuggle tobacco into Spain on the eastern side, on the western side, and exceeding the amounts that they can take take into the special zones as, uh, as we go towards the normal land frontier. So Gibraltar is acting. And if you look at the number of arrests, stops, searches, and uh, the number of cigarettes forfeited, Gibraltar is forfeiting more than Spain is, arresting more than Spain is. And, you know, that demonstrates that we're very serious about the issue, but that we're not going to allow anyone to do us out of a legitimate business in a commodity which is sold throughout the rest of the European Union in an appropriate way talk about what Mr. Hammond uh, said, uh, you'll know that Mr. Hammond spoke at the beginning of the press conference, Mr. Margallo spoke second. Mr. Hammond really didn't reply to anything that Senor Margallo said other than specifically about, I think, uh, some aspects of the Ukraine where he was keen to use, Mr. Hammond was keen to use the appropriate international legal language, which Mr. Margallo had perhaps not surprisingly uh, you know, gone off piste and said something else. The position of the British government and the position of the Gibraltar government is very clear and it's been expressed on a number of occasions in public and uh, directly to the Spanish government and to the European Commission and the, the, the British government and the Gibraltar government are exactly on the same page as to how we deal with the illegitimate aspects of the international trade in tobacco that affects all member states. At the press conference, Mr. Garcia Margallo also said he was hoping to see a return to the bilateral negotiations under the Brussels process. Gibraltarians might have expected the UK Foreign Secretary to nip this in the bud and pour cold water on the prospect immediately. But uh, Mr Hammond didn't do that. Instead, he said nothing on the matter till he was addressing only GBC, the Gibraltar Chronicle and Reuters in the British Embassy, where he spelt out the UK's position. Uh, there was a bilateral discussion, but it was about the European Union, uh, about Russia in Ukraine, about the fight against uh, ISIL and extremist Islamist terrorism. Of course, we touched on uh, Gibraltar issues. Um, I had to raise those issues because they're an issue uh, of continuing concern uh, to us. But the uh, uh, Spanish Foreign Minister understands very well uh, our commitment not to enter into any bilateral uh, negotiations with Spain on Gibraltar. We remain strongly committed to the trilateral forum, uh, and until we get back to the trilateral forum, the only talks that there will be will be the ad hoc talks about which we've already spoken. Well, 
um, Mr. Bagliari must be living in cloud cuckoo land if he hasn't worked out that it's not going to happen. And that's why the government of Gibraltar issued a press release on the same day where we said, look, he, Mr. Bagliari needs to understand that he shouldn't be saying this to the, even the press in Spain, the apparently in some instances gullible sections of the press in Spain that uh, sometimes report what he says without question because the double lock formula that the United Kingdom and Gibraltar have agreed in effect gives the government of Gibraltar in representation of the people of Gibraltar an absolute veto in respect of bilateralism and the return to the Brussels process which Mr. Madagascar has made an emblem of his uh, time in office. It's not going to happen. He needs to understand that no means no. A veto is a veto. V-E-T-O. There is no return to bilateralism because the people of Gibraltar won't allow it. I'm glad that um, Philip Hammond made the comments that he made. There's absolutely no prospects of there being a return to Brussels talks or a return to bilateralism at all. The United Kingdom government, both the Conservative government and also the Labour Party before uh, the Labour government beforehand, and gave a cast iron guarantee to the indeed to, to, to my government, to the GSD government at the time, that they would not enter into a process of negotiations without the consent of the Gibraltar government. And that's being repeated on a number of occasions. So that gives the Gibraltar government a veto on process. That's why the Chief Minister talks about dual lock. Veto on process. And indeed, then there's a veto on any results should we decide to enter into any kind of uh, 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 process of, of, of talks. Bilateralism is just simply not acceptable, not acceptable to the government, it's not acceptable to the opposition, and it's not acceptable to the vast, vast majority of the people of Gibraltar. So the sooner Mr. Margadio understands that, and the sooner we would be able to move to dialogue on issues that affect people at both sides of the border and where we'll be able to make progress. Forget about sovereignty. There's no, no, pro, no progress on sovereignty, still less progress on, so, on sovereignty on the basis or underpinned by bilateral talks. Can you tell us any more about the proposals that Mr. Margaglio made to Mr. Hammond who communicated them to you that very day, I believe? Look, I believe that, that people should be informed of what is happening in relation to something as important as uh, the attempts by Spain to uh, go back to bilateralism, change the structure of talks, etc., etc., uh, but it's also uh, impossible to conduct uh, discussions which might see a fruitful resolution by you know, exposing every email and every exchange to to publicity. So there is a, a, a confidentiality associated with uh, attempting at a diplomatic level to achieve things which we have to respect. But what I tell the people of Gibraltar is that they don't need to worry about any aspect of what might be proposed. It's literally just about language in the structure of how the talks might go forward. Uh, the issues are being considered by the government with the United Kingdom government. If there were any anything which co crossed our collective red lines as a community, where I think we are all, you know, at a political level and at a social level, agreed where those red lines are, the government would obviously, will obviously, not agree to a transgression of those red lines, um, and we continue to try and see whether we can achieve ad hoc talks. But look, we're also coming to a stage, Mr. Malagato said in Gibraltar there are electoral considerations, but well, we're coming to a stage where there are elections in the United Kingdom, there are elections at many different levels in the Spanish hierarchy of politics, and there are going to be elections in Gibraltar at some stage. Um, I think that it's not electoral considerations that are likely to mean that we can't progress much with uh, ad hoc talks. I think it's electoral timetables. People would just be out campaigning and doing other things, and therefore it's very likely that we are going to now not really see uh, what can happen in relation to this alternative process of dialogue until the results of general elections come in across the board. Because, of course, uh, the Socialist Party have confirmed in Spain that they continue to, to be in favour of the trilateral process. The United Kingdom Parliament is united on that, the Gibraltar Parliament is united on that. So the only parliament that has not uh, been prepared to allow its government to progress with the trilateral established forum is the Spanish parliament. And representation there may be very different after a general election. It's a matter for the people of Spain. We don't interfere with who makes up the government in Spain, but the results of that election may lead us back to the trilateral table where the United Kingdom and Gibraltar have been waiting for Spain now for three and a half years. The UK remains uh, strongly committed 
to the Trilateral Forum, uh, and we will continue to work towards ad hoc talks on a range of issues of mutual uh, interest. Uh, 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 Minister um, Garcia Magallo has uh, made some proposals today about how we might move forward uh, towards the uh, starting the ad hoc talks. So we will consult with the gov government of Gibraltar uh, on those proposals, and we hope that it will be possible for us to begin those talks uh, in the near future. Look, whether the timing is right for ad hoc talks to take place, I think it's a different, it's, it's a different question, and there are nuances to this. You can say, well, actually, there is a benefit to maintain that contact and to have that initial contact. What I'm saying is I don't actually think that very much is going to happen in relation to ad hoc talks, even though I can see that benefit of that contact. Because at this stage of the political cycle, where you have elections in Spain and the United Kingdom and indeed in Gibraltar, I think that very little is going to be achieved. Nobody's going to be really... And I, I certainly don't think the Spanish government is going to want to progress on anything that is substantial, uh, particularly in the mood that we see uh, Mr. Margallo. So, you know, I question how far this is going to achieve anything beyond that, perhaps building a little bridge and that first, and that first contact. Our position more generally in relation, to, in relation to talks is that as the architects of the tripartite talks, that continues to be our policy and we will not uh, be diverted from that, but that we will support the Gibraltar government for the sake of unity in attendance at ad hoc talks, provided that it is safe. And I have said in the past that it is safe if Gibraltar has its own voice, its own veto, um, and, uh, uh, and its own vote. So effectively, those three elements, which were the elements of the of inbuilt in the tripartite talks, provided that those talks are safe, well, I don't think that the Gibraltar government has anything to lose by, in fact, attending these talks. And indeed, we have to maintain the high moral ground. So provided it's safe, I think the Gibraltar government should be there. But the question is whether it's safe. And that I cannot answer without sitting down with the Chief Minister and, uh, and effectively analysing what the Spanish proposals are and whether these additional proposals and whether that is going to be acceptable to Gibraltar. Elections are going to be concerning everyone. So there is that issue which has to be considered by all the parties that might be present at ad hoc talks. Very unfair, of course, to say it's only Gibraltar that, uh, that is considering or is going to have to consider these issues. But you, Gibraltar has, in the context of what the strict timetable for elections is, the longest to go in the sense that Gibraltar's elections could be in up to December or beyond, three months after December, looking at uh, what the Parliament uh, Act says. But of course, that's never going to stop Mr Malagaggio. The fact that something might be unfair is never going to stop Mr Malagaggio. But look at what he actually said. And this demonstrates the man's inability to understand even the subject that he is immediately dealing with. He said, I would be prepared to get on a plane and go to Brussels tomorrow or this afternoon and have the talks. Well, took him a year and a half to respond to William Hague's first letter on the talks, so he can hardly point to anybody else being the, the party that delays. The talks are explicitly at a technical, non-ministerial level. What's he doing getting on a plane to anywhere in relation to the talks? The talks are technical, and politicians' timetables don't have to delay them, but of course elections will tie everybody up in all of the jurisdictions at a technical and political level. You're watching Viewpoint. We've been looking at the recent meeting of the UK Foreign Secretary and his Spanish counterpart in Madrid. You can join the conversation online using the GBC Viewpoint hashtag. And when we return, we'll look at Mr. Garcia Margallo's decision to close the Instituto Cervantes in Gibraltar.